Uh, first of all, I've, I've got to thank uh, Margaret Woodcroft of Shalott Central School. The images that I have were on my phone, my old phone. And if you've ever lost a phone and you haven't backed it up, you lose everything. So she was, I'm so grateful that she had all the images. Um, Kathleen Harris, but I, I didn't get the, but it, it, past president of the Chittenden County Historical Society. Thank you so much, Carolyn Gould, who just introduced me. Um, uh, Katie Woodward and Mike Hibben of the Shelburne uh, Pearson Memorial Library. I'm very grateful. And also I see Sue is, is here, who also has filled many roles over the years. Um, and uh, also, um, the person that started this, this is a talk, um, it's, uh, it'll not be an identical, obviously, um, but I gave a talk on Guy at the Shalott, um, for the Shalott Historical Society at the Shalott Library last November. Um, and so I must thank Martha Stone um, for um, starting this whole thing. And then I have some family members here, a couple of cousins and a husband and a sister-in-law, a brother, a son, and a daughter. So I'm very grateful for all of you that have come. So thank you. Um, Guy, um, he was born, whoops, going the wrong way. Uh, he was born in Tinsing, called Jin Jin now, and, and that's on the Bohai Sea, which is the northern part of uh, the South China Sea. Um, and it's about 100 kilometers from Beijing, which is obviously northern China. He doesn't know exactly when he was born, because it had to do with the phases of the moon. He knows it was between April 12th and March 12th, 1912. Okay? Um, his father was a rather prominent businessman. His mother, um, unfortunately, passed away at a very young age of, of 12. But their the connection with um, Guy is certainly through the maternal side. Um, his grandfather is Lin Cheng, um, who was more affectionately known as Ambassador Cheng, and that's C-H-E-N-G. Um, to the right is his mother, that's his daughter, okay? Um, and he was educated um, in the um, mid-1800s at Phillips Exeter. Became a very good baseball player um, and loved playing baseball. He then went to Amherst UMass um, College and he received an undergraduate, played baseball there. Um, there was a gentleman who you probably may know who he had been introduced because of uh, his baseball. His name was Theodore Roosevelt. Then became a president. Um, at completion of his undergraduate studies, he then received a, a master's in Yale at Yale. Um, he became ambassador to the uh, excuse me Great Britain, and that was uh, 1870, 1880ish. He, when he presented his credentials, which an ambassador has to do. Um, there's protocol. Protocol for a, a Chinese citizen was to kowtow, bow down, and literally show homage to the ruler. Um, in this instance, Queen Victoria. He had been educated in the West, and he knew that this was not a tradition, and he presented himself the way a Western person was. She was very touched by this, and he then became, soon thereafter, after becoming ambassador to Great Britain, Sir Lin Chen. He was knighted, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, and it was quite an honor. Um, uh, during the Roosevelt administration, he did become ambassador to the United States. Um, he had about uh, five diplomatic posts, and I know Belgium was one of them, and I believe Colombia. Um, I can't pull up the other one. Um, so, he, but, uh, and again, he had a, a lifetime uh, appreciation and friendship with uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and at some point, he disagreed with the uh, 
ruling um, uh, the people that were ruling, which is uh, I've got it here somewhere. No, not right now. I have to read it down here. Um, he, he, he had a, a falling out with uh, the Chinese government, and in protest, um, he uh, uh, went back to China and said, "I am no longer to be a, a, an ambassador. I will now be uh, just an ordinary citizen." And it was during this time that Guy remembers uh, his grandfather. Um, he had a wonderful, loving relationship with his mother. His father, it was quite difficult. His father had tremendous demands that he placed on his son, who was the oldest. And the oldest, uh, there's a lot of expectations, I'll say. Certainly, um, for someone of his stature in Chinese society. Um, and after his mother's passing in 1912, his father, excuse me, at the age of 12, that would be 24, he left the family, took some of the siblings, and went to Shanghai in southern China. Guy was still in, in Tsing. Um, and moved in with his uncle. His uncle was even harder on Guy um, to a degree where uh, he, he, he felt that his uncle was jealous. Guy was a very good student. He was a very good athlete. Um, he was liked by so many people. Um, and his son, Guy's cousin, he felt that he was a, a threat to him, and he went and at many times he was uh, uh, punished with the, uh, a stick. He had welts, and thankfully there was a wonderful woman that was a servant for his uncle um, who would take, took him under his, her wing and would you know, take care of the wounds and also would feed him because many times he didn't get a chance to eat with the family. Um, it was a difficult time, but he did very, very well in school. He just, he had the, this innate ability to love. And as you will see, there's been many times that that love um, definitely um, enabled him to, to live a wonderful and long and fruit-filled life, fruitful life. Um, it was, uh, at some point, he had, and he was very industrious, um, he, he had a, 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 a enough money and he bought a bike. And, actually, oops, I'm too soon. There it is. Um, his uncle was uh, jealous that he could not buy his son a bike, so he took it from Guy and gave it to his cousin. He just said, you know, this will pass. And around 18, things did change. Because he, he was also, he was playing a lot of tennis at the time. And he was very, very good at it. Um, he tried um, at uh, some time around 18 um, years of age to become, he thought he was good enough to play um, and become part of the what was uh, the, the prestigious tennis tournament, which was called the Davis Cup. And he thought he could go and play in that. The coach said, you're not good enough. Well, he's out of high school now, and he says, okay, I need to play. I really want to play in the Davis Cup tournament. He was friends with uh, a, 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 an army general who was, um, Oh, and it was the Nationalist Party, the Queen Yintang Party, that was the ruler, that was Chiang Kai-shek, was the head of that. Um, and uh, the, the, he was the uh, president that uh, his grandfather in, uh, went and said, I, I can't be a diplomat anymore, I disagree with your policies, um, and under protest. So anyway, um, this army general had a rather recalcitrant son, and Guy knew about this and said, hmm, 
This is in his industriousness that came through. He said to the army general, if you can fund me for six months, let me take your son to go to the Philippines and I will play tennis and I believe me, your son will come back a changed man. He spent six months, every tennis court he could get on, every player that he could play, and his game just went to new levels. Um, he did come back at six months, uh, played the number two player, beat him handily. Guy is now the number two player. And China was allowed two players to play on the, uh, to represent China at the, for the Davis Cup. Um, and the general was very grateful um, for him. Um, he played in the Davis Cup, uh, 35, I'm not sure, but 36 was here in the United States. Um, he played five matches total, two the first year, 36, three in the, the second year, um, well, excuse me, 35 was two, 36 he played three. He did lose them all. But he did play a, a very, rather spirited match with the number one player for the United States. And his name was Don Budge. He lost 8-6, 6-2, 6-2, and all matches were a best of three, five sets total. Um, to play in the Davis Cup, to play at Wimbledon, to play at the U.S. Open, um, uh, French Open, you had to be an amateur, a professional amateur. You had to reach a certain ability level, and he certainly was there. And he ended up playing 20 professional games as he was growing up. Um, in the French Open, he lost in the first round in four sets. Um, he did play at the U.S. Open, and this is in the 36. Um, and he, he won the first match, but then lost the second match against also Don Budge. But the interesting thing is that he was really winning. He was up 2-6, 2-6, 2-5, 15-40. If that means anything to you, that means one more point, and he will have beaten the number one player in the world. He looked up at the scoreboard and said, I don't stand a chance. <laughs> and guess what? Don Budge came back and won 8-6, so he won another point. Um, and then 6-4, six, 6-4. Four, six, four. Uh, he played in the U.S. Clay Court Championship and uh, got to the third round that year. Um, and then, uh, oh actually, that, I'm sorry, that was 1937 that he played um, that. And before the, the 37 tournament at the U.S. Open, he played uh, some preliminary, um, I'm sure it was, uh, back then it was clay, excuse me, uh, grass played on a grass court tournament, and it was interesting. There was a, a recruiter from the University of Tulane in Louisiana that was there and saw him play, and then he was at a, a gathering in the Hamptons in Long Island, and the recruiter was there and said, I saw you play. Would you be interested in a full athletic um, scholarship to come to Tulane? Again, there were so many things that he did to go through adversity, to understand that this too will pass. And as it comes, I'll read it towards the end, he had a saying that was so apt. Um, so he, he did agree to it. He played at the, uh, the, the U.S. Clay, Clay, Clay Championship and then was uh, uh, entered into um, the class of 41 for Tulane. His life at Tulane, he found out he was the only Oriental on campus. And he was accepted by really most of the students and the faculty, and he did extremely well academically during his uh, four-year uh, uh, degree that he did get in business. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to show you that. This is actually the picture um, that was taken of Guy for the uh, um, program at the Davis Cup. Okay, so I've got to make sure I follow my numbers here. So now he's at Tulane, and he is, this is in the yearbook, hard to see. 
he's in the middle, um, and he went and um, uh, was on the, uh, the, the tennis team for four years. And he played, he, actually his senior year, he was the doubles collegiate champion for the SEC, which is the Southeast Conference. Okay, Tulane is a school that belongs to that conference. They're really known as a football conference now, probably basketball too. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a, Southeast Conference is Alabama schools, Mississippi schools, um, Tennessee, um, Florida. They all have schools. This is the deep south, and Guy is from China. He met some adversity. We'll say. Um, when he did travel with his teammates to other schools, he had to sleep in different hotels. He had to eat in different sections of a restaurant. He had to drink from different water fountains, and he needed to sit in the back of the bus. We call these Jim Crow laws. Um, Sometime, I think it was during his junior year, his teammates said, enough is enough. And they went to the proprietor of the hotel and said, if Guy cannot be with us, we're not staying here. And we will find a hotel and we will stay with our teammate. He said, that's fine, we'll let him stay. And from then on, he stayed with his teammates in whatever hotel it was uh, in the deep south. I asked him, boy, you know, th this, was, uh, this was tough. You know, th this was what we read about in history. This is just rumination. And he said, you know, I had had such a wonderful experience in the northeast of, of the United States. I was accepted everywhere. And I said, you know, this will pass. And it's certainly, we've had a, a, quite a black mark in our history when it came to this. Um, but we have the laws on the books to take care of this. And with a lot of work, that work is still being done. Um, he also, there's, whoops, there's a, a photo when, when he was hiking somewhere, and I have no idea, but I, I just had this, so I just wanted to throw this up. Um, when he was at Tulane, now, one of the, uh, the, the captains was Ernie Sutter, um, and that was his senior year. And he became very good friends with Ernie, and his brother, who had graduated two or three years, Cliff Sutter, was also a very accomplished tennis player. Uh, lived in the Northeast. Um, his brother visited him, and they became, Guy and, and Cliff became very good friends for many, many years. Um, and Cliff uh, was in the New York City area, and he was a member of the Forest Hills Tennis Club. And that's where the U.S. Open was held. Um, at some point in the 60s or 70s, it moved to Flushing Meadows, which is where the U.S. Open is now, which is also right next to where the um, World's Fair was in 64, I believe 65. Um, at somewhere in 85, 86, maybe 87, um, Mr. Cliff Sutter did invite Guy. He had courtside seats. Um, if you sat in his seats, you would see the player serving. Um, he was slightly off center, um, and that's, those are pretty good seats in the center court of the main stadium, which is probably back then the Arthur Ashe Stadium. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, three, four seats away, maybe five, was a gentleman named Don Budge sitting there. <laughs> And he went and reintroduced himself and said, oh, I remember you. I should have been beaten in the U.S. Open, in the 37 U.S. Open. I don't know how I came back. That was one of the more, more difficult comebacks I've ever had. Um, 
He did graduate um, as the captain uh, of the Tulane tennis team in 1941. In the fall of 41, he continued his studies and graduated in 43 with an MBA from Tulane. Okay, how did he end up in Vermont? Well, dean of students brought him in at some time during his, during his freshman, sophomore, sophomore, uh, junior year, and said, you know, guy, you really need to get a job somewhere and spend the summer and um, he's going, oh, I've got to get a job. And, well, he noticed a New York Times, and the New York Times has a huge section in there for job opportunities. And he's looking, and he's like, what can I do? I'm, I'm in a business uh, curriculum, but I really like tennis. So I started looking for tennis instructor positions that might be there. And guess what? Cap, Camp Abnaki and up in the islands was advertising that they needed a camp uh, tennis director. Well, he sent his resume, and within a week, uh, two weeks after he sent that, an envelope came with a bus ticket and money to um, uh, get some few things to, on the way up, and said, when you get to Burlington, there will be this gentleman named Bob Adson that will be there. And? This is a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Adson, Bob Adson, and Guy, Guy Chen. Um, he, I don't know how long he worked there, but I know it went on for a few summers. Um, Bob was, it was a, uh, one of the um, camp counselors and had spent many a summer there growing up. They became such dear friends. Well, the connection to Chittenden County, more specifically Charlotte, was um, Thompson's Point. Thompson's Point is town-owned land with numerous camps on it that are owned, the dwellings are owned by very uh, many families, um, some here in the Burlington area, but many throughout the country um, that do own the, these camps. And the Adsets had a camp there. And so he spent many summers there um, uh, vacationing and, and enjoying the ambiance. Well, at Thompson's Point, they have a wonderful tennis facility, two, three courts, clay courts. They have um, a rec center with ping pong tables and um, restrooms and things. And it's very antiquated. It's, it's, it's a very unique place here in, in, in the Chittenden County area, probably all of Vermont. Um, that they have so many camps because there's hundreds there. Well, there's also hundreds of kids running all over the place. And he said, huh, why don't I offer some tennis lessons? And he offered tennis lessons in the um, 40s and 50s, right up until the late 80s, um, early 90s, um, for all of these youth every Wednesday morning, from 10 to 12, he offered a tennis lesson. And there's many, many people that uh, had the opportunity to um, develop a lifelong passion. Um, Guy was now, um, he was in an untenable situation. He had received a visa to go to school, and now he had temporary visas to stay in the United States. Um, immigration was first and foremost on his consciousness and his mind, and it seems that that is still the case today. Um, he had very, very limited opportunities at becoming um, uh, 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 someone from China that could become a naturalized citizen in the United States, which he deeply desired. Um, the problem was, is that up until, I'm um, backing up a little bit, up until 1941, um, there was a very, very limited amount of Chinese um, citizens that could emigrate to the United States. It was somewhere around 100. The demand was much greater. Um, prior to that, from uh, the 
1860-ish um, onwards until uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, there was a tremendous demand for Chinese labor. And, and that was primarily out in California. And they built, the Chinese labor built the levees. They built, uh, they had a lot to do with the railroads. We all know about uh, um, the connection of east and west. And they had a tremendous amount of, well, there was a backlash about those too many Chinese people that have come to the United States. Well, in 1941, something was going on in December, uh, certainly for the United States, um, and that was World War II. It was at that point uh, the Chinese had been fighting. Uh, the Japanese, um, uh, somewhere around 37, 38, um, and, and as a little side note, I wish I had a picture of it, but there was a, a, a cover that guy had as, in his office for years and years and years, decades, of his brother that was his second, his first brother, he was the second born, who was uh, trained by the US Air Force and was a pilot. Um, and he's on the cover, he, he ends up sending this, this uh, letter to uh, Life Magazine um, and stating, wow, it was such a, an honor to, to see my brother on the cover of Life magazine. Um, unfortunately, he didn't realize that at that point his brother had already passed away uh, and was shot down by the Japanese um, somewhere around the South China Sea. Um, so just a little side note there. But the big thing was is that Chinese um, were allowed to now emigrate into the United States the last guy was not allowed to. So he really came down to one last option, and that's called an act of Congress. And I, I wish I had a picture of it. Um, I don't. If you can all be careful with this. Please pass this around. That's the actual act of Congress. I did find some information um, that in uh, May 10th of 1948, uh, there was a full house that was considered this resolution. It passed. It then went to the Senate, and it passed unanimously in the Senate. And he then became in uh, is that April 24th? May 24th. May, May, May 24th, he then became uh, able to become a naturalized citizen of the United States. Um, the help of our senior Senator Flanders and our junior Senator Aiken cannot be undermined. They did a tremendous amount of work to get him to become a naturalized citizen. Another side note. It's, uh, and the act of Congress is, is rarely used to become a naturalized citizen. Um, the person before Guy was someone that you probably recognize, and his name was Albert Einstein. <laughs> Guy was the next person after Albert Einstein to receive an act of Congress. Um, This was huge. He had this, this weight was just totally lifted off his shoulders. And he had a weight, his youngest sibling, a brother named Lot. He made arrangements for Lot and his wife, and this is a much later picture, um, to be able to come and emigrate to the United States. To, to come to the United States, he had to do three things. He had to put $10,000, and this is in, the, well, I think that was around 1951, 52. Um, he needed to put $10,000 into escrow. He needed to find housing, and he needed to find him a job. He put $10,000 into an escrow account. He found an apartment for he and his wife, and his sister-in-law, Betty, and he found him a job at the Burlington Savings Bank. 
This job lasted through the 50s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s, and Lot ended up being a vice president, I believe, of commercial real estate. And if anybody knows, speak up. Um, very industrious like his brother. His wife um, had a business um, a few miles from here, a couple miles, called Lady Shelburne, which was a very successful business. Um, and they added a tremendous amount to Chittenden County also. Guy is now um, living in Vermont. And he hits another bump in the road. He develops tuberculosis. And he is bedridden. Um, and this is the third big challenge that, that Guy had met. The abusiveness of his father and uncle. Um, discrimination in the Deep South. Um, and each time, something good came out of this. And that can't be undermined how this was able to germinate within his consciousness. Um, he said, wow, I don't like laying in bed all day. And he started making jewelry. And at the end of this, what I would like to do is I've got some examples um, of some of his work. I, I've, I've had um, and some of the things that I've made that have continued to make that that um, he has and I, I will actually I'm just going to send it on the um, You can take it out, take take it out of the bags if you so please. I'm going to go each way. This side, this side will get actual work that he was working on, um, and I'll talk about them. And on this side is actually finished pieces of jewelry that he made. And you can all look at it, make sure they end up in the bag, and thank you. So, if you could take a look there. So, yes, and when, at the end we'll talk about that. Correct. But just, this, this was the time, I think, to, to see some of his, his work. Um, the swirls, though, was, it was an Egyptian swirl design. And he became very proficient at it. Again, the guy was very industrious. He sent some examples to a company you might have heard of, Tiffany and Company. <laughs> he, um, they loved him. And they said, we'll take boom, hundreds, thousands of them, however, and go, whoa, we've got to make a lot of these. Um, and he sold them for many, many years. And I remember seeing, and I, I wished I'd kept it, an ad. Tiffany always has in the New York Times, you open up, it's, it's page three, top right corner, it's called the Tiffany Corner in advertising. Um, he went and um, there was an ad that was placed there of his swirl bracelets that was put in there sometime in the 50s. Um, he uh, was healed and saying, I really like this work and was looking for a place of business. And this is where Shalot came in again. Shalot had, up until about 48, six or seven one-room schoolhouses throughout Shalot. One of them was on the border of the North Harrisburg Shalot border, um, right at the base of Mount Philo uh, on Route 7. And it was a wonderful building, he said. This is it. He put a closed bid on it and ended up procuring the property, uh, and he ended up expanding the uh, farmer, the OB farm, uh, family owned the land uh, to the uh, east of him, and he ended up buying a lot of that. He was able to put in um, uh, an extra additions to the, the property, along with, at some point, a tennis court, and a swimming pool for my mom. But that's getting ahead of things. Um, at some point, I'm not sure exactly when, it was sometime in the mid, um, uh, six, uh, excuse me, 50s, he married um, uh, his wife, Jean. And Jean had a daughter named Dawn, who we loved very, very much. Uh, they were married for 10, 12 years. And this was another challenge. It was a very, very difficult 
relationship. And no matter how much he tried, it just, things didn't work out. And he was, it was very, very difficult. Let's just put it that way. Um, so in 67, I believe, um, they were divorced. Well, and now uh, we're getting into, uh, this is actually during his marriage with Jean. His business is thriving. He has uh, a shop, he's making jewelry. He also has um, a, a um, many uh, regional, national artists with a lot of oriental themed um, gifts that he offered. And then he had uh, his office and right up above there is where the picture of Life magazine was and I wish I could have found one that would have had that. But he, he was, he had many, many um, mementos things that, that he liked on the wall, and one of them was uh, the adsets of my sister, their um, marriage here, and, oh, actually, what am I saying? Here is the picture. I'm seeing it. I'm sorry. It's, it's so blown up now. I can see it. If you can zero in on that, it's right above and to his left um, is the picture of his brother. I do see that now. Uh, and that was in Life magazine. That's nice to see. Um, okay. During this time, when he had his studio, which is right here, and he had his gift business, he had many people that he employed. Um, and I do have two that have decided to come and listen to this, this talk. Um, and I've even got a picture of you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And my daughter. There you go. And my sister. There you go. Um, well, th th this was perfect. I'm glad you came. So you've got some memories here. Um, Guy just loved young people. Um, the work that he did in tennis, he ended up coaching the CBU tennis team. He was part of, they called it the Big Games, Burlington International Games between Burlington, Ontario, and Burlington, Vermont. Um, he, he just he, he coached the UVM tennis team for a while. He was very, very active in, in the um, for youth and younger, um, yeah, younger adults, we'll say. Um, so, uh, there were many, many people that he did employ, and he, he loved them all. Um, these two he loved the most. <laughs> and I have to say, there's another one, yes, Nancy, who is here. Um, but Chick would um, humble farmhouse girl from Shalott, um, who's made it on the big stage now, uh, was employed by a guy. She'd been recently divorced. And there was a very, very good friend of Guy's and my mother's. And his name was Bob Wood. Um, Sierra Woods Corporation, originally of, of South Burlington, now in Williston. Well, they met in Stowe on their way back from a buying trip, and the rest is history. They had a wonderful, wonderful relationship in life. Um, and that's just one little side note um, of the goodness that, that came from all these people that uh, um, Guy um, employed over the years. Um, his, his bench, though, I gotta mention this, had just this wonderful expanse of you, you can't see it, but this window looked out over the Adirondacks, and it was just so beautiful, it was so peaceful um, uh, for, for Guy. And, and during this time, he also continued to play a lot of tennis. He was good friends with many of the, the Burlingtonians um, 
that uh, um, were very good athletes too. And then in around 59, um, a, gr a group of them started what became known as the Burlington Tennis Club, or BTC, which then expanded his um, uh, people that he played. Uh, and, and it was just a, a wonderful opportunity to continue with his athletic prowess. Um, he was also, again, a really good athlete, and he had really quick hands. And um, I have to thank Molly King for this. Molly? Did you? No. Okay. Um, and there's another image. This is my mom here, and Bob Wood, and. Oh, there, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and then. Guy was recruited to play with the Shalott Rockets. <laughs> now, Shalott Rockets, uh, many towns had skating rinks in the winter, obviously, and Shalott certainly had one. Um, Bill Williams owned the old brick store. Harry Webb of the Webb family. Uh, Mr. Moore of the Chittenden Bank, I believe. Um, uh, I've got uh, Mr. Burton, who is a relative of Harry Webb. Um, they all uh, were on this team, and I've got some some photos of Guy being the goalie. I love the cars and the truck in the background there. And this is a, a real wonderful photo of everybody. I wish I knew everybody, but in here is uh, all these Shalott and some Shelburne uh, residents. Um, uh, Guy single-handedly kept them in a lot of games. Um, well, this rink became something that the we were called the Cisco Boys, and that was myself, my older brother Bert, and my brother Todd, and we lived at the Shalot Skating Rink, and they had a warming hut there, and we all brought our hockey sticks and hockey pucks, and we just had a wonderful time. My brother became a pretty good hockey player, Bert, and actually Todd made the team, and as did I. Uh, but Bert is the one that uh, I prominently point out because he was on the hockey team from 66 to 69. And in 68, someone did some planning because my mom always went to Bert's games. Well, Guy, unbeknownst to him, was invited to go to a game. So, yeah, why not? And it was uh, because of um, Gene Dolliver, whose son was also on the CBU hockey team, that they went. Well, that just so happened my mom was there, and she got introduced to Guy, who everybody knew Guy. And she was going, oh, boy, what's he doing here? <laughs> and, well, the rest is history. Sparks were flowing all over the place. I was in, in front of them, and they were laughing and joking and little kids, and I go, oh my ears, I can't take this anymore. I went to the other side of the rink, and I'm still here. <laughs> that was in, in the, the uh, uh, November or December of 68, and wow, their relationship blossomed. Um, they dated until 1970. Um, they would have gotten married sooner, but there was a Vermont law, and I don't know how long it went on, but between the divorce and becoming remarried in Vermont, you had to wait a few years. And sometime around um, the summer or late summer of uh, 1970, they could get married. Uh, I, I just, I had this picture of um, that Molly had that she sent me, so that's a guy during a Christmas celebration somewhere, I'm not sure where. So, in, on September 12, 1970, absolutely gorgeous, beautiful day, um, 100 people or so, 75 people got together and celebrated the marriage of Guy and Barbara Chen. Um, it lasted over 30 years. They were glued at the hip. They went everywhere. They talked constantly. They were 
constantly um, inviting people into their homes. Uh, it was just so incredible. Um, Guy lived uh, at Mom's house, which was on Hills Point in Shola, um, from 1970 until 1984, when they sold and expanded their place on Route 7 and put in uh, just an absolutely wonderful um, living arrangement with, uh, it had a, a wonderful master bedroom with a kitchenette. It had this massive deck um, everywhere. Uh, and, and it was full of geraniums and these beautiful flower boxes that my older brother made. Um, well, I gotta take a step back. Guy, I said, loved children. Boy, he now had four children that he considered his own. And I think he found out that he may have bitten off a little bit more than what he <laughs> expected. Um, I don't think that we were that much of a challenge, but from other people, I heard uh, the opposite. Um, there were times that um, things that were done that maybe shouldn't have been done. And he was very, very good at instilling, though, um, some, some uh, life lessons that uh, uh, were, were very, very important. Um, so that was my older brother, Bert, my brother, Todd, my sister, Beth. Um, and we were all educated in CVU, uh, CCS and CVU. Well, Guy also inherited moms, siblings, and mother. And her mother was Eudora, a World War I nurse. Just this wonderful, loving woman who went to the Shabbat Congregational Church every Sunday. And from 1965 or so on, lived with us um, as my mother started a career in higher education um, and ended up becoming a, uh, a uh, uh, experimental psychologist. And that and, and was the degree that she received in 1970. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Is that so, Bob Is Bob Atzett yeah. actually my uh, stepfather, who became my pop, my mother, Barbara, my sister, Beth, and then well, I'm about to get into Aunt Gingy, yeah. who is Virginia Cocker. Okay, you may have heard of her. That was my mother's sister. And that's what I'm getting into right now. And that's the wedding picture. Oh, and this is the, um, he took this off from, uh, and put on another jacket at some point, but this was his Davis Cup jacket <laughs> from 1936. Now this is 1970. There's no way I could fit into something from that much time going by. So he, he stayed very fit and very much and the, the, the activities that he did certainly enabled him to keep his weight down, let's say. Um, but he, he just loved um, Eudora, his mother-in-law. And the siblings were, it was Art and Betty Davis, and we have a daughter, Jill, and a son-in-law, Volker, that are here. He owned a Chevy uh, Oldsmobile and, and Cadillac dealership in Windsor, something like that. Um, he had uh, the, the second, third born, my mother was second born, was David Davis. Unfortunately, he has too many wives to count. He <laughs> was down in Florida and had a hard time staying married uh, with one woman, let's put it that way. Um, but he was a criminal defense attorney, and he also owned the largest limestone deposit in all of the Southeast. And that limestone built, because it could be turned into cement, could be turned, uh, built the Interstate 95 and Disney World. Um, and next was Ginny, as I said, Virginia Cochran and husband Mickey. All four 
of Aunt Gingy and Uncle Mickey's children made the United States Alpine Ski Team. And they all participated in the Olympics. Um, one of them was Barbara Ann, Marilyn's second, a uh, first um, sibling. She's the second born. Um, she won a gold medal in slalom at the Sapporo Olympics. Um, and then about two years ago this winter, Barbara Ann's son, um, uh, Ryan, won a silver medal at the Beijing Olympics in Super G. Uh, and then uh, the last one was Harriet Petropolis, who married Dino. Um, they were both chemists, and Harriet taught in the uh, chemistry department at an area of Rochester High School for many, many years, and her husband was a chemist at Eastman Kodak, Uncle Dino. Um, in, as, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to go through this. This is Bob, Mary Lou, um, Mom and Pop, and Aunt Gigi toasting. And this is a picture of the Adson boys and the Cisco boys and sister. And the last one. Uh, this is, now we're getting into um, some of the things that the uh, Cisco children did. And this is um, my sister's uh, picture, uh, class picture in 6970 at Shawan Central School. She's at the very bottom. And that's my little sister, Beth. And this is a picture um, of, of friends, and, of, and Beth is down at the top. Um, and that's someone you may have heard of, Ethel Atkins. Is that ring a bell? Yeah. Oh, she's an icon. Um, for many, many years, she ran the uh, food services at Shalott Central School. The fudge lady. Yeah. <laughs> the fudge lady. <laughs> there you go. Um, and this is Grandparents' Day, and this is Kelly Cisco, Todd's daughter, um, and Grandpa uh, at, at the Shelburne uh, Elementary School. Um, so then, uh, and this is just a gathering, uh, which just happens all the time. Guys and, and mom, they, they invited so many, encouraged us to invite friends to come to um, the house. And, just, and we'd sit around and we'd have the most heartwarming conversations, just about the world and life and current events and things that were going on. Um, and this is a, a picture of my, my brother's house, Todd's house, um, and Anne's, excuse me. Um, and there's Bert, the oldest, myself, my sister Beth, and then Todd. And Guy, as I say, loved us uh, so much, and I'm just so, so appreciative. Um, he, he actually um, gave us really four principles to live on. And I've taken it to heart, is to love life. Be honest. Hold yourself accountable. Hard work never hurt anyone. And care for your family, friends, and your community. And that, that, that was instilled at a, a, a very young age for us uh, in the relationship that Guy had uh, with, with my mom. Anyway, to, to jump forward, this is something that was one of Guy's most proudest moments, was my mother in 1973 received a graduate um, degree in experimental psychology, a doctorate, a PhD. Um, I want to take a step back. To go back to 65, she was in a master's program, a master's in psychology, and now it's time um, a year or so, two years later, so it's now time to become, um, uh, to announce what degree she wants to get as a PhD. And she said, I want to be an experimental psychologist. Well, she was told, well, men are experimental psychologists, you know. <coughs> uh, uh, she said, why just 
just men. Well, that's why it's always been. This is not anymore. She became the first woman from UVM to graduate with a PhD with an experimental psychology, even though she had to write her dissertation three times. The men had to do it once. She personally. Thank you, Mom. Um, the graduation pictures. She's receiving her, do her doctorate here. I believe this is President Andrews that's presenting it. Uh, who was at UVM at that time. It certainly looks like him. The word. This is afterwards. This, you've got to focus in on this. This is your daughter. This is his mother in law. This is mom. I believe that's on Gingy and Guy. And then a picture of Aunt Betty. Um, uh, there's Betty Chetty here, Mock Chetty here, Uncle Art. And I'm trying to see others that I, I know, but that, that's what I recognize. But I'm glad I saw the picture of you, Dora. That, that's so endearing to see her. She was so proud of her daughter, as we all were. Um, it was at this point, um, actually before this point, we all called Guy Pop. Um, and we all grew up on Hills Point. We had our cousins come many, many times. We were on the lake. We water skied. Um, we played football, soccer. Um, the Davises would come up. The Patroclus's would come. The family was so important to us all. And Guy was, um, if he wasn't at the center of it, he was pretty close to it because he was so, uh, uh, just the warmth of his heart, how much he, he loved everybody. He played cribbage, it's not cribbage, um, bridge, for hours, thank you. Um, and, and it was just so, so wonderful. Um, so he went and um, gave us this, this, this structure to enable us to, to be able to go on and, and live and, and do the lives that we, we do. Uh, myself, I became um, very, very much uh, uh, loved working in this metal, in precious metals, and I've had my own love affair with making jewelry and, and uh, uh, selling jewelry and, and talking to people about what their wishes might be, and, and I love that very, very much. And I'm very, very appreciative of that um, so much. Um, uh, I'm just looking at the time here. Okay, this is good. Um, so in 1984, the shop had, had to move on. Guy was retired now, and he was actually working for me, though, because I had so much work, it was wonderful. He, he would work uh, two, three days a week and, and help me greatly um, with my business that I had. Um, fixing things and doing things. So I kind of gave back what he had given to me. Um, but they, they ended up moving to, to Shelburne um, over here at uh, the Green, Greenbush Gardens. Uh, excuse me, Gardens uh, townhouses. Um, it, what was interesting um, is that I remember mom sending a note to all her Shalott friends because this kind of thing between Shelburne and Shalott. Is it Shalott and Shelburne over all these years? I don't know if there's any Shalott or Shelburneites here, but apparently there was this um, a, a little bit of a, a back and forth about who was better. Um, she sent a note to all her Shalott friends saying, we're always going to be Shalotters, so please understand that we are, uh, are not giving up our Shalott residency, we're just becoming temporary. Shelburne. I thought that was kind of a neat little note. Um, Guy lived this life that was really based on love. I, he had a, a simple saying that I alluded to earlier, and that is, don't, the, life is too short, don't sweat the small stuff. We have the capability of making small stuff big. All of us do it. 
he constantly was making big stuff small. Because it too will pass. And it, it just was so important to him that he lived that way. Um, and so he I was always constantly telling me, for some reason, because I was making these big piles of things, you know, life, um, it will give you all kinds of uh, opportunities, and don't sweat the small stuff. Um, I would like to ask my, my brother, Todd, to give a, a reminisce about um, our pop um, that meant something to him. I've got some things from um, my brother Bert. Actually, I'll just mention that my brother Bert right now, then I'll get my, my sisters, we'll go in order. My brother Bert um, was a graduate student in master's program at the University of Vermont Education. And he had a show um, where, uh, on, back then it was called Vermont ETV, which is now Vermont Public. Um, and he had uh, uh, a taping where he was interviewing people that were continuing their education. And at one time, he interviewed Guy. And he said, what, 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 what is the biggest thing about how education always continues in your life? And he said, you know what it was? He says, in 1970, I married your mother, Bert, and I found out that my education continued, and it continues to this day. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of neat. If Todd could come up and, and mention a, a few little reminiscences. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming here. I'm Todd, David's brother. In talking about pop and stuff, a few things. One, I want to correct something. My wife's father was born in 1911, and David said it was 1912. But I want to correct him. He was born in 1911. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. Okay. And they were 13 years difference between my wife's uh, father and her mother. So I just want to correct that to you. The other thing, we always celebrated because we didn't know if it was within like a month or so of when he was born. But we came up with uh, somewhere around uh, April 12th. So we always celebrate his birthday on April 12th. But, um, didn't bring my glasses. <laughs> so hopefully I can read. When uh, mom and pop went back to China, uh, he was talking to me and saying, you know, I haven't been back there in a long time. I don't know how to speak the language. And I said, pop, it'll come back to you. It'll be fine, you won't have an issue. So as soon as he got off the airplane, he saw his family there and just like that, he was speaking fluent Chinese again. So uh, I was really happy for him. When Pop first date of my mom, I was away. And my brother Bert, I, I came back and I said, what, what was it? Because I haven't met him yet. He said, what was he like? And you remember the show Bonanza? And there was a guy on the show, which was their cook, called Hop Say. So my brother, Bert, comes in and goes, what was he like? He goes, he's just like Hop Say. Very nice to meet you, Mrs. Cisco. Very nice to meet you, Bert Cisco. And that type of thing. He had the round glasses and the big ponytail down the back. And of course, my brother was doing the pranks at that time, as he did. And Pop was a very handsome man. Uh, um, he always was visiting friends. He always went out of his way. He would cook something, bring something to someone, and that was really, really important to him with the connection of all. And I think Chicky and Claire, and I know my wife will attest to all of that. The other thing, he was really, really a very, very good cook. His culinary talents were exceptional. And he would make egg rolls, to this day, I believe the best egg rolls around. I think everyone who's had them will attest to it. They're excellent. 
Now, my wife, Ann, went over. Annie, come up and stand up. Just, just stand up for a second. And tell come on, this is my wife, Ann. Step. And she, I just want you to tell everyone about how you were when you went to a cooking session with them. And the cooking session there, well, it was difficult because their thing was measured. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, and all of those types of things. And so Annie always had a hard time because she's a very good cook as well. Um, the, the egg rolls, the, the black bean beef, you remember the black bean beef? And the teriyaki burgers and things like that. Um, he also was exceedingly generous uh, to all of us siblings, to his adopted family, uh, and his kindness. He kind kindness dwells within Pop, and it really did. And that was one of the nicest attributes he ever had was the kindness. David exemplified it as his love for everyone. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Brother David, for what you did. Appreciate it. I did want to uh, mention what uh, the youngest of the family, she will always be the baby, and that's uh, my sister Beth, our sister Beth. And she um, wrote to me and said, you know, I, I saw this, the, the goodness that came out of his heart because he gave me a gift. He made me a little um, silver heart on a chain and gave it to me the first time I met him. And yes, my brother Bert was, yeah. <laughs> he was difficult for us all. Let's just put it that way. But he was the oldest and he, he thought he was right. But it, it really was, it was so endearing. Uh, we all had this, this incredible relationship um, with this man um, and did show us how to love and to live. And this is such an endearing picture this is at his, at the garden side, top condo, uh, townhouse. Um, paper in hand, next to his wood stove, um, keeping warm, with that beautiful warm smile, and just saying, yep, life is good. Thank you all. <laughs>